Welcome to Whitetail Rendezvous Podcast. This is Bruce Hutchin, host and executive producer. Each week, you will hear tips, techniques, strategies, and personal stories from some of the best and funniest whitetail hunters in North America. Hope you enjoy today's episode. If you do, tell a friend on social media. If not, tell me and I'll make it better. Thanks for listening, folks. This is Whitetail Rendezvous, episode number 402. It's going to be a fun show today, ladies and gentlemen. Jessica Johnson, the daughter of Donnell and Dave Johnson. They're the owners of Hunt Data, and I used them last fall to uh, find out where Rocky Mountain Bighorn Sheep are in my unit. And Jessica shared with me about giving a speech in a journalism class about hunting, about the complexities of applying for a tag here in Colorado. But it was more than that. You'd be surprised at the reception she got. It was somewhat neutral, and there were some positive aspects uh, of the um, speech that she gave from her journalism teacher. So she's also a hunter, so don't let that pass you by. She's got some tips, techniques, and her love for hunting, the, the hunting tradition passed on by her mom and dad. So sit back, relax, and enjoy today's show with just today's show with... Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous. We're staying right here in Colorado today, and we're going to connect with Jessica Johnson. Jessica is a student, University of Denver, studying journalism, but she's from a hunting family. Um, Her mom and her her good friend, Lisa Thompson, own Hunt Data, and uh, you should check that out. But needless to say, Jessica did a neat little um, blog post, uh, podcast post on the complexities of applying for the draw. That's what caught my eye, and that's what we're going to talk about today, plus other things. Jessica, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Bruce. It's good to be here. So um, in the warm-up, we were talking about, you know, the complexities of the draw, but more important than that, the role of women and your role on college campus today, specifically uh, Denver University, and what people's response is when they find out you, you actually – hunt and you go out and kill things and eat them let's talk about that for a little bit yeah um so basically the general response that i get is first of all surprise um hunting here on campus in denver in general isn't really the most common pastime for sure um especially on a college campus um a lot of people tend to be a little bit more liberal and a little bit less open to things like hunting and guns and things like that they have found that most people are pretty unfamiliar with it. Um, now, that being said, um, the people that I've encountered, that I've talked to about hunting, t- tend to be pretty open to learning, open to understanding it. And so um, one of the things that I really enjoy doing is um, kind of educating um, or at least talking through hunting in a way that allows people to have a more accurate view of it. Um, so I made this podcast, this last podcast was on the Colorado hunting draw, Um, because a lot of people really don't understand that, you know, you can't just go out and do whatever you want, bring your gun and shoot whatever animal you want. That's not how hunting works. There's a really formal process. Um, It's very much regulated so that um, it's sustainable and it's um, good for the ecosystem and that kind of thing. Um, And also, so I also made, a couple months ago, I made a podcast um, that talked about the conservational aspects of hunting, because a lot of people don't understand that, um, you know, the money that goes into buying, purchasing licenses um, goes directly back into conservation. Um, and so although hunters are physically taking animals out, they're also, they are supporting um, the future of that species. Um, and so basically, because of what I feel like is a little bit of a lack of maybe general understanding about hunting on campus, um, I have kind of tried using the avenues that um, are at my disposal to kind of help um, educate and just bring more awareness. You know, I'm not setting out to convert anybody to hunting by any means, Um, but I just want, I want when I say that I'm a hunter for people to understand what that means and to know that, you know, I can still be somebody who's concerned about the environment and who, um, who does love animals and I can still hunt. Um, And so that's kind of, I found on campus and, and how I kind of um, deal with with talking to people who really don't know much about hunting here on campus. 
Do people realize um, the amount of money that hunters put into local economies, but um, that they basically support all the game management in the whole state? Uh, I've talked to a number of people, um, birders um, and great people, and they take great photography, and they don't consume um, the uh, animals that they take, but they also don't um, buy licenses. Yes, they buy camera gear. Yes, they travel. Yes, they stay in motels and hotels, eat meals. Um, but the largest amount of revenue for Colorado comes from licenses. And for a birder, there isn't a license. Yes, if you want to get on a park, you pay the park pass, but so do people who just want to go catch a fish or, or camp, not do any um, uh, thing that takes uh, animals out of the out of the uh, environment. And do any people ever talk to you about that, about how, you know, how massive the amount of uh, money that goes into the state is from hunters? You know, I don't, here on campus specifically, people just don't know that. Um, but I know that specifically I come from a hunting family. And so that's um, part of just kind of what I learned about it by growing up surrounded by it. It's kind of like, you know, mom, dad, what's your rationale behind this? Why do you hunt? Um, and it really is something that does help the environment. And so um, especially in the, my own personal research that I've done in Colorado, that's one of the biggest places, uh, biggest sources of revenue um, in recreation is hunting. And so um, you can, you know, you can Google it and see just how much money the state does take in um, from hunting and fishing licenses. And that's a lot. Um, I, when I was doing my, um, my other story on uh, conservation and hunting, I talked to um, some representatives from Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and they're basically just saying, you know, hunting makes conservation much more possible. Um, and it doesn't seem that way when you're talking about taking animals you know, out of the natural ecosystem. But it actually, the money that um, is spent on hunting licenses directly goes, you know, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, things like that, that do help um, make sure that these species continue. And, and another aspect of hunting, you know, beyond just the revenue um, that does help the environment is, you know, they, they do control population size. And whether it's a hunter going out there and doing that or whether it's, you know, a game, the game management people who have to um, control those population sizes, if those populations get too big, um, the animals get unhealthy and, and they're not going to survive anyways. And the ones that do are going to be really unhealthy and underfed. And so um, it helps the, the, the ecosystem in a lot of different ways, um, not just revenue, but, um, but also in just making, keeping that balance um, in the ecosystem. And then just one step further, you know, we eat what we hunt. And so um, hunted animals are a lot, first of all, a lot healthier than what you're going to pick up in the grocery store. And second of all, um, the amount of, you know, grass and, um, and resources that have to go into, you know, producing um, to, to a sustaining a cattle farm or something like that, that's actually a lot greater than, um, than what you, what happens when, you know, there you, you harvest an elk. So, um, so there are a lot of different ways in which hunting is a very sustainable way um, to feed your family. And, you know, it's hard. It's not just like walking to the grocery store and picking up your food. It's, you know, going out there and having to outsmart a really intelligent animal and respecting that animal enough to work really hard for your food. And so there are a lot of different amazing aspects to hunting that really um, have helped me to kind of um, to learn to appreciate it and to want participate in participate in it for myself so well said um you know you have a very strong grasp but again i know your 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 mom and dad and, and how passionate they are about all the aspects of hunting and this isn't just the kill it's it's everything that goes into it and um, your mom just traveled over to hawaii and was able to hunt over there uh, and uh, exotic species uh, that basically in hawaii They've got too many of those, um, of those, uh, I'm thinking it was a goat, but it might, what did mm -hmm. she harvest? It was a goat. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I I'm just, not really entirely sure specifically. If right. There was a but I wanted to make sure, I wanted that. to make sure of that, but you know, when you think about that, um, college campuses, uh, really don't teach 
unless you're going to an ag school or a school that teaches um, wildlife biology. And, you know, it's, it's foreign to a lot of people. And I think uh, a voice such as yours um, is very healthy uh, for people to take another look and go, wait a minute, just because, you know, a neat, a neat gal, she's a smart person. And so why does she think that way? Um, other people won't. There's people out there that'll think you're Darth Vader and, and that'll never change, unfortunately. Um, it, it never will. And, and you realize that. Moving along, let's let's take it from the college campus and let's take it right into the Johnson home and talk about the hunting tradition because a lot of people have different hunting traditions, but the hunting tradition is really what we're fighting for today. And um, so let's talk about that for a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah, so I didn't get started hunting and hunting till a little bit later. Um, I went on my first hunt when I was 16. Um well, as a hunter, I should say, um, I went on several hunts before that, um, with my family, um, just kind of as a bystander, um, but just to even go a little further back, um, my dad has been a hunter pretty much his whole life. Um, and my mom, her family hunted, um, but she didn't really get into it much, um, until a little bit later on. So when she married my dad, she noticed she was spending all this time out in the outdoors and she missed her husband. So she decided she'd better start hunting. Um, and so beyond, um, after that happened, um, she actually <laughs> fell in love with it. And today I would say she probably hunts more than my dad. Um, she's kind of crazy, um, about hunting. So, um, that's pretty awesome. But, um, so basically my whole life, um, hunting has been a big part of that. Um, it's been a way that my parents have been able to spend time together. Um, and then out of that has born, um, the hunt data, which is, um, my dad had the idea for it um, when they moved to Colorado and he was hunting and couldn't really have any success. And so he developed um, maps and software to basically help scout, help you um, figure out where you want to go hunting. So that part of, has been a big part of our life. Um, hunt data is something that both my mom and my dad care a lot about and work really hard on. And now in Bass Pro and um, Sportsman, uh, Sportsman's Warehouse and things like that. So that is a little bit just about um, how hunting is important to my to my parents. Um, my mom is also, um, I guess, a professional hunter. She signed with Fast Pro and Mossy Oak and a couple of her, other different companies that sponsor her. Um, and so I didn't really stand a chance, I guess, um, in terms of not being a hunter. Um, but basically just from a really young age, um, learn to appreciate the outdoors. Um, I didn't start hunting until a little bit later, but I, you know, we were always going camping. We were um, going with our parents hunting, um, learning to appreciate the outdoors. So um, that part of my life, that's always been a part of my life, the outdoors of Colorado. Um, and if you <laughs> spent any time in the outdoors in Colorado, you'll understand how amazing that is and how um, once you get out there, how it really does become a little bit of an ad addiction, um, seeing the beauty that we have here. Um, and so I actually went on my very first time when I was 16, like I said, um, it was an elk hunt. I went on a, um, a youth hunt, basically a guided youth hunt. I had a hunting mask or a hunt master who went with me, who guided me. Um, basically I didn't see a single elk the entire time I was there, um, which was super frustrating, but also I think kind of, uh, an accurate depiction of what hunting can sometimes be. Um, I do remember it was really awesome on my very first hunt. I didn't see a single elk, but I did, I did get to see a moose, um, super close up. I got to shoot it with my camera, uh, not my gun, but that was really awesome. And a really just, um, a good experience to show me, um, a lot of the, the kind of the good and bad of hunting of, you know, you're not going to be successful right away. It's going to take a while probably for you to even see an animal, let alone get a shot. Um, and hunting is a challenge. Um, people sometimes think, you know, it's, you go into a pen and you shoot a domesticated elk or something like that. And that hunting does exist for sure, but hunting is a challenge and it's, it's really difficult and you have to put in a lot of hard work. And so, um, that first time for me definitely set the tone for that. Um, that's what was just kind of showing me, you know, the beauty of the outdoor is seeing a moose that close, um, 
was my first time ever seeing moose, so that was just a really cool experience. I still have that photo, um, and and it's something that I look back on really fondly. Um, so in general, you know, hunting for me has hasn't been. I would say I'm not as <laughs> I'm not as crazy. I don't think I would be as crazy into hunting if it wasn't for the family component that goes with that. So um, I either, you know, I'll go out hunting with my mom or my dad. Um, when I harvested my first elk, I had the privilege of having my mom to my left and my dad to my right. Um, and that was a really cool experience because I know they were really proud of me. Um, and, and that was kind of their legacy of hunting that got passed down to me. And, and so the family component of hunting is super important to me. Um, it's a way for me to spend time with my family um, and and to have a common interest with them. And so um, without that piece, without the the um, the people connection part of hunting, um, I think I don't think it would be as amazing as it is. So thank you for that. And, you know, that's a wonderful snapshot of about, um, you know, one, your family and, and spending time with your family and, and growing uh, those um, those bonds because a lot of people don't have that in the, in the world today. Uh, we're uber busy. And um, that's a shame because we're missing some of those quality times. Now, um, you've gone on hunts with your mom and dad just with your camera, but you're, you're, you're hanging out with them and you're in... in um, some rough country or you're in some places that normal people won't trot. So, you know, it gives you a different aspect from my, this guy's viewpoint, it gives you a different aspect about just, um, you know, where life is going and what your journey is about. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think there's a lot of um, benefit of just um, getting off the beaten path and getting out of, you know, the crazy city into those places, the, you know, the tough terrain or um, things like that, because um, it really gives you a new appreciation um, for the environment, for the outdoors. Um, and, and um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a really amazing experience. Um, the, I mean, it's just watching the sunrise um, from the middle of the woods on a tall mountain, you know, and you don't, nobody knows, um, nobody has necessarily sat in that exact spot and seen the sunrise. And it's a really incredible experience. Um, it, you just, it, you can't, I don't know, you can't replicate it. You can't, you can't explain it to somebody until they've, you know, been there and seen that amazing, you know, beauty that is Colorado. Um, and that's something that's so cool about hunting or in general is, you know, it's not just about killing an animal or um, having that experience. Um, it's a lot of just like a lot of the time you don't even see an animal. And so what you really are doing is you're venturing into the outdoors and you're um, getting to experience a really raw, untouched part of that, um, which is super cool to me. Hey, if somebody wanted to get a hold of you and have a continued conversation pro or con, um, how would they do that? Yeah, so you can find me on Twitter. Um, I'm pretty active on there. Um, my Twitter handle is jmjohnson109, so you can find me on there. That's jmjohnson109. Um, and and you can tweet at me or DM me or something like that. Um, that's also really cool. And then if you want to listen to any of my um, audio, we're going to have links to my SoundCloud. Um, and my story is here, um, but my name is Jessica Johnson, so you can find me on SoundCloud that way. Um, and yeah, hopefully connect with me and see the kind of stuff that I've been producing. So. And another shout out for um, Hunt Data. I used it uh, last fall when I was hunting sheep in Colorado. I was unfortunate that I did not uh, harvest a ram. But uh, the information provided uh, helped me um, save a lot of time in scouting because I was able to figure out oh, the historical data where sheep had been taken and use that to zone in in some places that, um, you know, I knew sheep were going to be. So it wasn't, uh, thinking, okay, you got all these Rocky mountains now, where would those sheep want to live? Well, I, I sort of kind of knew that from the beginning and, um, huntdata.com uh, just go to it and and take a look because, uh, if you're hunting Colorado, I think they also have Utah now, don't you? Yeah, we do. 
Um, we also have Arizona, um, and we're working on another state right now, but I don't actually know what that is. Um, but yeah, we, we do, if you go to the website, you can find all that information. Um, we um, are also in, you know, Bass Pro, Cabela's, um, Sports and Warehouse. So you can find us there, find us on our website. So folks, if you're coming out west, take a look at Hunt Data. You know, moving on, and let's talk about um, something that you represent, which is the fastest growing outdoor segment uh, in North America, and that's being a woman. Uh, why do you think that trend is going upwards? I think in general, um, there's a trend of female empowerment in general in the United States of women being like, Hey, you know what? I, this thing that I've always thought wasn't for me as a woman, I want to try it and I want to, um, I want to experience it. Um, and so something like hunting is, you know, it can be seen as something that's very, um, I guess masculine or, um, you know, very physical and things like that. And I think women are realizing, Hey, you know, I, I can do that too. Um, and so, I know, like people like my mom um, and her her best friend Lisa Thompson, both being female hunters and professional hunters, um, or women who represent the industry. I think people like that are, can be very inspiring to somebody who you know maybe comes to a hunt show just with their husband um, and sees, you know, actually, you know, this doesn't have to just be for my husband. Or you know, if I'm not comfortable harvesting an animal, maybe there are other aspects hunting I could accompany my husband or my brother or something like that or you know another friend that hunts um and I, I don't necessarily have to harvest something but I can just go out and experience it um as a woman that's possible for me um and I think I know you know my mom gives a lot of like turkey 101 classes or you know things like that educational tools and that's happening more and more with females um in the industry kind of stepping up and being like, Hey, we'll help you figure out how to hunt. We, we do it and you can do it too. And so I think informational tools like that coming from the mouths of women, um, are really important and effective in getting women into the outdoors. Um, and I, I don't know. I also just think, um, that, that, um, that women are, uh, how do I want to say this? I think, women are kind of just more powerful than they think they are. You know, you think a little petite woman can't pack out an elk, but you know, Lisa Thompson, she's about, I don't know, five, four, five, three. And she, she can bone out an elk, you know, quarter it and pack it out on her back. So I think, um, I think it's just a matter of times are changing and that's a really cool thing. And it's really empowering that, um, that I, as a, 20 year old girl can can go out and um harvest my own food and um and provide for my family so that's really cool and thanks for that you know you, you talk about you know hunting and you talk about um your love for the p- photography pardon me photography and explain to people you know what that means to you yeah so i have always had uh, definitely a love for photography in the outdoors, um, photography in general, actually, I should say. Um, I love photographing anything. Um, but I don't really think um, that with without hunting, I don't really think that I would have the opportunity to photograph the things that I do. Um, you know, I don't know that I would have the motivation to just climb um, up a giant mountain to get an amazing shot by myself. I think hunting has given me that opportunity and has opened my eyes to that because um, those are things that I don't necessarily, I wouldn't ever necessarily know that I was missing without those two being married together. Um, And also like, like I said a little bit earlier, there are times when, you know, I don't necessarily, I'm like, no, you know, I could go pheasant hunting with this giant group of people. um, But I don't necessarily feel like I want to bring my gun today, um, but I'm going to bring my camera. And, that to me is super awesome as well. Just, um, I don't know, there's, there's so many cool aspects to hunting and to the outdoors. And I think, um, I think it's limiting to say like, you have to, you know, be, you know, on a hunt or looking to kill an animal, um, to go hunting. I think, um, I think just bringing your camera and the companionship of it, um, 
can be just as rewarding personally. Um, so yeah, photography for me is definitely a really awesome outlet that um, allows me to just um, appreciate what I'm looking at, appreciate the, the nature that I'm in. Um, and it gives me um, another reason to go out with my family. So. And thanks for that. And, and folks, we're going to kind of switch it up now and, and talk about the complexities of applying for a draw. Even um, though Jessica uh, spoke to the Colorado in any Western state, uh, if you're going to uh, apply uh, to hunt in the state, you have to go through a process. You have to pay money. You have to fill out forms or get on a computer, fill out a form there. And um, that's where hunt data comes in, helps you figure out where you want to hunt in the states that they do cover. But let's talk about that, um, that podcast that you did in one, why you did it and two, what you found out about the complexities of the draw. Yeah. So, um, basically I, I talked a little bit about how on campus there seems to be kind of a lack of knowledge about the process of hunting. And so, I really wanted to do this podcast. I did it for one of my classes here. I'm a journalism student, so we are currently doing some podcasting. And so I I just thought, you know, this is a unique idea. Um, and I don't think anyone else in my class would have even thought of it, thought to do a story on hunting. Um, and, and also I have um, a couple of friends here in Colorado who um, are a little bit newer to Colorado or new to hunting in general and haven't applied for the draw simply because they don't really know where to start. Um, and I was like, you know, that shouldn't, that shouldn't happen. If they want to hunt, they should, um, they should have some kind of resource out there. Um, at least if it's just my podcast or if that's um, something else, they should have, you know, the resources to go out and, and, and apply for the draw. There's a lot of complex parts about it. Um, so it can be really confusing. So I thought, um, you know, why not? I'm going to go down to Colorado Parks and Wildlife and, and I talked to um, the former draw coordinator, the current draw coordinator, and then another um, CPW statistician there um, about just, you know, what are the common errors? What, what trips people up? Um, how, you know, what are the resources? And so basically um, I found that a lot of the errors are because in Colorado, the, the draw process, um, you can either apply online or you can apply on a piece of paper. Um, and most of the problems that people run across um, come on those paper applications from things not being readable or um, them not filling out certain portions, like, you know, not putting their social security number, even though that's something that that's a non-negotiable that has to be on there. So um, I, I basically just kind of talk to them about, you know, what are those common hiccups that people run into? Um, and then what are those resources? And so, you know, there are a lot of, you can go to the Colorado Parks and Wildlife website and they have um, the regulations that you can look at. They have um, the hunt brochures, um, which give all the hunt codes, which are super important as well. Um, hunt codes are basically, um, they refer to a specific hunt. So, you know, your species, your season, um, your method of take, rifle archery, that kind of thing. Um, and so basically, as for me, I, you know, I have been hunting for little less than five years now. Um, but in, in a lot of ways, I'm still very new to a lot of the parts of the process. And so for me, the hunting draw, like I've always had help from, you know, my mom or my dad when I'm applying. And so, um, I personally had never taken on that task. And so I thought it was really valuable for me as somebody who, you know, knows about hunting, but doesn't know about the draw to go in there and be like, what is the deal with this process? Like how, what, what do I even do? Where do I start? And so, um, yeah, I learned a lot of really cool things. Um, one of the big things that, um, to know about that is that next year, starting next year, the paper applications are going away. Um, and, and so that is partially, well, mostly I think due to the fact that, um, the paper applications, you know, they consist, the, the, they don't get in proportion to as many applications as they get the paper applications make up a very small percentage of the number of applications they get as a whole. But um, in terms of errors, they account for like, I want to say like 80 to 90% of the errors that the CPW receives. Um, I have this specific um, statistic in my podcast. Um, but yeah, so basically the paper applications are a big trip up for people. And so that will be changing next year. 
starting on uh, January 4th, I believe, of 2018, those are going away. Um, and it'll be all online or by phone. And so um, just learning those things about the draw. The draw is con constantly changing. Hunt codes change every year, of course. Um, and then obviously the process changes here little by little. So I, I kind of just wanted to, um, for myself, um, for, the, for people that I know who might be interested in getting into hunting um, with limited licenses and things like that, um, that would need to apply for the draw. I wanted to give, to make a tool for them um, where they could just be like, where do I start? Um, so that was kind of what I, what I wanted to do. Now, do you have the link you can share right now from on SoundCloud? Um, so on SoundCloud, the the story is called Outdoor. Uh, sorry, excuse me. The story is called Hunters Navigate the Colorado Draw. Um, and let me just look and see. It's got a pretty um, pretty long URL. Um, well, but if be, you um, you don't have to do that now. It'll be in the post, in the show notes, folks. So uh, when uh, Jessica's show comes up, um, all you have to do is go to the show notes, and I'll have it embedded there so you can go directly to uh, to that link. But I wanted to make sure that, um, you know, she, she gets um, she gets credit for that and, and gets some downloads because it is important, no matter what your age, um, if you're applying in many Western states, you have to apply via the computer, you're going to pay the money. And if you do make a mistake, um, you don't get the license. They don't call you up and say, oh, by the way, you forgot to um, do X or Y. Uh, this doesn't happen because thousands and thousands and thousands of people apply. Did, do you know the number, how many applications um, were taken in um, last year? I'll actually pull it up. They, I think they, they talked about this um, stat and I, uh, I have it in my post, and I'll just pull it up really quick. Um, but, yeah, they do have a ton of applications every year because Colorado is um, unique in that we have so many species available to hunt. Um, so let me pull that up. Um, so, yes, yeah, so the stat that I was given um, was that they get fi over 500,000 application, applications. Excuse me. Um, so they get 500,000 applications every year, um, and of those, they get about 22,000 errors, um, and those have to be looked at by people, and that's the reason why um, sometimes applications get thrown out, um, just because they don't necessarily have the manpower to go through and call everybody, you know? So basically what they do, they go through, and they see if they can fix the error anyway, if it was something that was on their part was a mistake. They try to fix that and give you the benefit of the doubt. But at the end of the day, you know, if you don't, if instead of putting in your hunt code, you put deer, um, you're not going to get put in for the draw. So that's, that's one of the common errors. That, um, hunt codes are a source of a lot of errors just because they're so specific. And sometimes people don't really understand why they can't just say, you know, I'm going, I want to go archery hunting and I want to hunt elk. Why can't I just put that on my application? And it's just, so many areas in Colorado, so many species um, that they have, they have this system of very specific hunt codes that allow them to kind of expedite that process. Thanks for that. And I'm going to give a shout out to a great company um, in the digital world for hunting. It's, it's called Go Hunt. If you have any questions at all, Go Hunt has a, a portion of, of their site called Insider. And That'll give you the hunt codes. You can go specifically to them. You'll find out the hunt codes. You'll find out the due dates. Um, everything you need to apply in many, many Western states uh, is available. So what I wanted to say very simply before you apply, you don't just have to rely on what Colorado uh, sends you or off their website. You can go get a lot of information. Um, just like hunt data will help you figure out where you want to hunt. Then you can work it down and get the um, game management unit basically the hunt codes and, and figure it out. But it is daunting uh, if you've never done it. And, um, maybe Jessica, you could write up, you could write a book on that. that that'd be great for an Eva. Get it published. on Yeah, Kindle. for sure. I'm sure there's enough little details about the draw to definitely sell a book. There are a lot of exceptions and a lot of just little things that have to get taken care of um, when you are applying for the draw. So and maybe I'm sure that's a, a possibility. Yeah. Maybe you can get an A from your professor. 
Sorry about that, folks. We had some technical difficulties. And uh, Jessica, we're at the time of the show where you can uh, get some shout outs to family, friends, and people that helped you along the way on your hunting journey. So um, the mic's yours. All right. Well, first, I want to give a shout out to my parents, David and Danelle Johnson, um, who basically taught me everything I know about hunting and um, gave me the foundation to be able to do um, this awesome thing. Um, and also, Lisa Thompson. She is also definitely a really amazing source of information as well as a really great friend. Um, um, and she's been on many hunts with me and I really um, am thankful for her. Well, on behalf of thousands of listeners across North America, uh, Jessica Johnson, thank you for bringing uh, uh, some campus insights to the world of hunting to Whitetail Rendezvous today. Thank you for having me. Hey, don't miss the next show, Extreme Element Outdoors with Emmett Enyard. They hail from Pennsylvania and a group of guys that love chasing whitetails in their avid bow and muzzleloader hunters. He's got a crew that love to just to share the reality of hunting, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Stay tuned. It's going to be a fun show about Extreme Element Outdoors. Interesting show coming up, folks. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.